UFC 310 is the last pay-per-view of the year. It's also a very unique fight card. We have a UFC debut in the main event fighting for a title. But he's not a complete unknown. He's a two-time world champion in one of the largest promotions on the planet. We also have a brand new co-main event, a five-round fight between undefeated Shavkat Rachmanov and undefeated Ian Gary. UFC 310 is objectively a very good fight card. My name is Angelo. This is We Want Picks, and I'm going to walk you through every single fight, giving you my pick predictions and bets. Before we talk about UFC 310, let's look at the UFC 309 just for a half a second. UFC 309 was a really fun fight card, and I vlogged my entire day. We played some drinking games. We did some really fun stuff. If you want to check out that vlog, check it out. Thanksgiving's next week. You're going to be in the car. You're going to be avoiding your family and weird political conversations at the table. So watch the vlog. It's a good time. It's a lot of fun. And it's a completely different piece of content than we normally put out there. This is the thumbnail. It is on the channel. We got a whole bunch of vlogs if you like that style of video. Let's also spend 30 seconds to talk about UFC Macau. That ended. I am filming this on a Saturday. Normally, I'm sitting here on a Sunday morning. But UFC Macau started at 2 a.m. my time. Ended by 8.30 a.m. So why not get you the UFC 310 picks and bets early? UFC Macau was an interesting fight card. That woman on the right almost died. It was an insane card. We had one of the biggest upsets in history. We had an absolute banger of a main event. And if you want all my raw thoughts, opinions, immediately following that fight, here's the thumbnail. It does have the Home Alone face. And I walked through every single fight on that card, how I thought it went, and what I think should happen next for each fighter. Here are the bets from UFC Macau. It was a wild fight card. The wrong underdogs won. The wrong favorites lost. But overall, it was a successful card for We Want Picks. We made money. And I'm using we very loosely because Jacob carried this horse. Jacob put up a phenomenal 70% ROI on his bets. It was more than enough money to cover a couple of my missed bets as well as come out on top with a 15% ROI combined between the two of us. But if we take a look, we zoom out a half a second, look at my last 13 cards. I am up 11 of the last 13 cards. The only two cards that gave me a little bit of trouble were UFC Macau and UFC Paris. They call me Consistent Ange, and that's because I have given you more than 11 units of net profit in the last couple of months and a 22% ROI. This is the long game. Anybody could have one decent week and then blow it five in a row and then another decent week. Big Ange running the stretch. 11 of the last 13 fight cards with a spectacular return on your investment. But it's not just all the cards. Pay-per-view specifically, I do quite well. Here's the last five pay-per-views, a 37% ROI, almost eight units of net profit over five pay-per-views. If you want to unlock all the picks, all the bets, all the tools, and everything that you could ever need for UFC 310, let's go out this year with a bang. You can get it all right now. Wewantpicks.com. Click become a member. at It's freaking $10. It's $10. 10 10 That's a coffee at a fancy place. Unlock everything right now including the safety parlay. Safety parlay did miss that woman who looked like she almost died at UFC Macau. Yeah, I had the over two and a half in that fight and she got absolutely smoked in the third round. So I did miss that safety parlay. But the safety parlay in general continues to be the beacon of stability. I hit seven in a row. I just lost. So I have won seven of the last eight, almost six units of net profit, 68% ROI from one single bet. You can get this now as well, wewantpicks.com. And we have 12 units of bets already on the board, ready to go between UFC 310 and UFC Tampa. 12 units that you can unlock. And it's not just copy-paste bets. You also get tools, a data analyzer. So obviously we have two cards left this year. Then we have a little bit of a break. And then we kick 2025 off with a bang. The data analyzer is preloaded with all the data, insight, links to videos, and anything you could ever want for future events. It's not week to week to week. It is loaded months ahead of time. So use this time. Get ahead of the betting lines. Do your research. Check out our bets. All of that. We want picks.com. Click become a member. It's $10. You're going to get the DraftKings optimizer. You're going to get the line movement tracker. You're going to get the prop hunter. All of these are updated already for UFC 310. And for 310, we will film a vlog just like we did for 309, 308, 307, and so on. 
So first, check out the 309 vlog. And then second, if you want to send something, I will open it. I will read your letters. I will do all the things on the vlog. If you're a small business, you want to promote something right before the holidays, We Want Picks, P.O. Box 406 in Prosper, Texas, 75078. That was a five-minute intro. That wasn't so bad, was it? We're not going to complain about a five-minute intro, are we? On the run that we're on, having success at UFC Macau, let me live a little. Come on, guys. Quick disclaimer, this card, UFC 310, is in a week, meaning there's a week off. We have Thanksgiving, there are no fights, and then the week back is UFC 310. So it is not a normal Saturday run. The good news is we do have a bunch of bets. The bad news is if you wait and you don't check those out, you might lose some of the odds. These lines are going to go weird because we got a couple of pretty obvious favorites, a couple of live dogs, and I expect a lot of movement. These weeks off always have a lot of movement. This fight is the newest fight added to UFC 310. If you are watching this video, and it is fight week, I recommend you check the channel for a newer video because I am 1,000% sure there will be a newer video. Me solo, Jacob solo, or combined. So just make sure... You check out the newest one for any adjustments to fights. We've already had a couple of fights drop, and I imagine they're going to get opponents. They're going to be added back onto the card. This fight, Chris Weidman versus Eric Anders, this was moved. This fight was originally supposed to happen at UFC 309. Eric Anders on fight day had some sort of illness, so they pulled the fight entirely. Now he's booked here, but this is at 195 pounds. This is a catch weight. So I don't know if it's at a catch weight because of whatever medical issues Eric Anders had or it's at a catch weight because both guys were like, listen, I just cut weight. I just did all the things. This is right after Thanksgiving. Don't ruin my holidays. Let's do it at 195. That could be. I'm not sure what the illness was. If you guys know, it would be nice to know. But here we go. We got Chris Weidman taking on Eric Anders. The analysis essentially stays the same. I'm just a tiny bit more confident in my pick now. We got Chris Weidman, former middleweight champion of the world. We all know the accomplishments he has had, the people he has beaten. One of the better middleweights to do it. He's a very good wrestler, solid striker. He has had a great career behind him. He's an all-time personality. Nobody seems more fun than Chris Weidman. If you watch the pay-per-view weigh-in shows, obviously he won't be on this one, but if you watch the other pay-per-view weigh-in shows, guy's a great time. All laughs, hanging out, knows how to bust chops with the boys. He is 40, though. He is slowing down, and he is coming off that infamous double eye poke win over Bruno Silva. He's taking on Eric Anders. Eric Anders won a football, American football, not the football, a football, good old American leather tossing football national championship with Alabama. So he is a big time athlete. He's big, fast, strong, coordinated, all the things that you would think. A phenomenal football player would be. He comes forward. He throws heat. He makes fights ugly. He can try to get these fights to the ground, and he has in the past. He can hit very hard. He makes fights ugly. He does a phenomenal job hurting you in every single exchange that he is in. The problem is he's a little bit slow. He can also be taken down. I think Chris Weidman is going to come forward. I think he'll shoot a couple of takedowns. He looked very good at the UFC 309 weigh-ins. His spirits seemed up. He seemed ready to go. And whatever illness or issue Eric Anders had can't be good. Even if it was like food poisoning, right? Like a temporary problem. We're still going to be a few weeks removed. He cut the weight. He had the issues, the disappointment that comes with it, the pressure. We don't even know if, if he wanted this rebooked. Maybe he needs the money before Christmas. I have no idea. But I already thought Chris Weidman was going to win this fight. I already thought that Chris Weidman could come forward, make something happen, get a takedown or two. Be aggressive and sneak out a win. So I think there's going to be a little bit more of the same. Chris Weidman is the pick, continues to be the pick for this fight. Then we have Vicente Luque taking on Temba Garimbo. This is also a new matchup. Vicente Luque was already on this card. He was supposed to fight Nick Diaz. Then video surfaced of Nick Diaz crouched on the ground. I am not exaggerating. Crouched on the ground shirtless trying to light like pavement or grass on fire, looking like a literal crackhead. This is not exaggeration. I'm not doing a soliloquy. The guy looked like a crackhead. His arms were ridiculously skinny. He was tweaking. 
And maybe, yeah, listen, we all know he smokes a ton of weed and it's perfectly legal where he's from. Maybe he took a bad mushroom, had a weird trip, but he did not look good. And then his wife or his girlfriend, whatever the hell she is, posted some like lady quote on her Instagram and it said something like, uh, addiction will take the best of them. All of that added up to he's off this card. I hope he's okay. I wish him the best. Nick Diaz, all-time MMA personality, put on some of the best fights, gave us some phenomenal entertainment, created the Diaz brothers and that whole persona. Conor McGregor isn't who he is without Nate Diaz. So I'm wishing that guy the best. And that's a long rant to break down this fight. Anyway, Temba Garimbo steps in. And he's the favorite, and he might win this fight. Because although Vicente Luque is one of the most experienced guys on this fight card, definitely the best fighter that Temba Garimbo has ever fought, he is getting a little worn out. He's pretty good everywhere. He's got power in his hands, solid wrestling, good takedown defense, fantastic submissions, if it gets to the ground. And at the end of the day, he is a striker. He's looking to bang it out. He has a 62% takedown defense. And that might seem low. But if you remove the Bilal Muhammad fight, where he got taken down over and over and over and over again. Vicente Luque has only been taken down seven times in 16 fights. He is coming off that TKO loss, though, to Joaquin Buckley, where he'd had a hard time finding Joaquin and managing his range. Taking on Temba Garimbo. Famously, last year, I believe it was, The Rock bought him an apartment. The Rock loved his story. Temba Garimbo is just a hardworking guy that came to this country, living on the floor, trying to live out his dream. And so far, since he got that apartment from The Rock, he has lived up to some of the hype. He continues to win. He's on a nice little four-fight win streak. He's a distant striker. He manages range pretty well. He picks his shots. He is very long for this weight class, and he uses that length to keep you at bay. He is typically a counter striker, but he'll charge forward when he sees his openings. He has solid takedown defense. He's going to widen that base and make you carry his weight. He also has solid offensive takedowns. He has 17, one seven takedowns in his five UFC fights. He's coming off another dominant grappling win over Nico Price. Temba should win this fight. I am going to pick him to win. He has established himself as a very good wrestler with plenty of cardio. If he can stick to that game plan, the same game plan he's had in his last two fights, then he can definitely win. But Vicente is by far the best fighter that Temba has fought. It is not even remotely close. So we're going to find out if Temba can pass this test. It is a very big test to cast. I am going to pick Temba. I don't think I'm going to bet on him. Two to one seems a little wide. And certainly he can win this fight. But that's just a lot of money to spend on an untested guy over a very, very good Vicente Luque. I will say, though, he kind of quit against Buckley, and that's not a great look. I actually built these graphics. I mean, they, and these these are some of the... You're, you're not going to see better graphics than this. You're just not. You're going to see a bunch of dweebs with topology in the background. Sorry, Artem. You're not going to see this. Look, I mean, look at these things. I build these by hand. They're, they're magnificent. And when I build the graphics, it actually helps me with some of my analysis because I build the graphics a few days before I break down the fights. And as I'm typing the numbers and I'm looking at it and I'm seeing them, things go off in my head. I was shocked when I typed 3-3 for Vicente Luque's age. I was shocked. I was like, this guy's not 38. He had, he had a brain bleed. Jeff Neal made his brain bleed. Like this guy has had major like physical issues. I thought he was 38. He's only 33. It is crazy to be that worn out at 33 years old. But that also shows you the entertaining fights that this guy has put on for us. So, you know, there's that. Also, follow us on Instagram. All these graphics are there. Then we have a very debatable fight. Debatable meaning you people will 100% debate this fight in the comment section. I am positive of it. I have already seen people debating this fight in the Discord, and we're still a few weeks removed. We have Randy Brown taking on Brian Battle. Brian Battle making a pretty quick turnaround here. He just fought at UFC Paris, had an all-time speech at the end. We'll talk about him in a second. We are going to start with Randy Brown. Randy Brown is a very good striker. He uses range really well. He's stupid tall at 6'3 for this weight class, and he takes advantage of that. He uses long jabs. He uses kicks, and he keeps you at bay. And then when he's ready, He's going to use his speed to initiate boxing exchanges. He has nine takedowns in the UFC. And while he doesn't go to them often, he's got nice little trips, some uchimadas, some cage work, solid jujitsu on the mat as well. He is very good. He's a lot of fun to watch. He's coming off that decision win over Liza Zaleski where he was taken down four times, but the striking was so dominant, he got the knot. 
taking on Brian Battle. Absolute dog. Pooh Bear, as they call him. He's constantly pressuring, constantly working towards something. He has shown us that he has solid ground game and he is never out of a fight. He averages around one takedown per fight. He does have a pretty miserable 28% takedown accuracy. He is improving at an insane pace. Every single fight physically looks better. Skills look better. He's building some dog in him. He's building some confidence and it is showing itself in the cage. He's coming off that incredible win over Kevin Jusset, where despite getting the second round knockout, he was hit a few times. More than any of his previous fights, actually. Kevin Jusset hit him more than any previous opponent. And that's because Kevin was a decent striker. Kevin also had good takedowns. Brian had a bit of a grapple-heavy game plan in that fight, but he wasn't able to do it because Kevin Jusset was a high-level judo practitioner. And I actually think Brian should come into this fight not grappling. Because I worry if he's going to come forward and try to grapple and Randy Brown can defend some of those takedowns, Brian's just going to get hit. He's going to get touched up. He's going to get smoked. Randy is such a good striker. But Brian has big power. And Randy has been dropped by powerful strikers in the past, like JDM, Chaos Williams, Vicente Luque, who we just broke down. And if Brian can keep this fight ugly, if he stays busy, if he tucks his chin, I think he can win this fight. But if he comes in sloppy, looking for random takedowns, I think Randy's going to pick him apart. Randy needs to worry more about Brian's random power than he does Brian's takedowns. His takedown accuracy is trash. So I don't recommend that Brian battle and that insanely long neck of his start looking for takedowns. I do recommend he gets in Randy's face, removes the range, and keeps it ugly. I am going to pick Brian Battle. I have never picked a Brian Battle fight wrong. When he lost to Renat, I was all over Renat. Everybody else, I picked him to win. I'm pretty sure I bet on almost every single one of his fights. Even the Renat fight, even in his last fight, I'm actually not going to bet him here. Three to one? Two to one on some books, it's it's widening and tightening. It's going all over the place. No way. Randy Brown is good. And Brian Battle still has to clean things up. Like He's getting through with his insane cardio and his determination. He's a real man. His post-fight speech against Kevin Jusset was phenomenal. Just shit on all the French. He didn't care he was in France. Shit on all the French people. He said, I'm not losing to a... F Did he, he might have called, I don't know if he called him the P word. I'll say it. I'm a, a pussy. I don't know if he called him that, but... He's like, hey, you think I'm losing a, a fist fight to a French guy? It was unbelievable. Good for him. I'll be rooting for Brian Battle. I do want him to be somebody. This is just, these odds are too far gone, and this is a really, really tough fight. Then we got Cody Durden taking on Josh Van. Cody Durden, 17-6, and six, plenty of experience here. And while Josh Van is listed as having 13 fights. He's still a pretty young kid at only 23 and doesn't quite have the same experience that Cody Dernan has. Cody Dernan's a pressure wrestler. He averages almost five takedowns per fight. He likes to come forward. He'll throw looping power shots and then he'll look for takedowns. He's gonna chain wrestle. He's gonna continue diving at legs until he ultimately gets it to the ground. While his wrestling can be nonstop and the pressure doesn't wilt, he doesn't have a lot of control. That's why he's ending up with almost five takedowns per fight. He's slipping, he's sliding. He does have great cardio, great pressure. Chin, very suspect. Not a great chin. He is coming off that bounce back win, though, over Matt Schnell. Taking on Joshy Van, baby. Solid striker. Good aggression. Bit of power. Some nice power mixed in there. His takedown and scramble skills are decent. He's only 23 years old, so he's going to be constantly improving from fight to fight. He is this next generation of fighter. So even though he is primarily a striker, he's good everywhere. He can do all the things. He does a nice job looking for things in scrambles, making people work. He is coming off that bounce back win over Edgar Chavez, where his offensive striking was on display, but he looked like he lacked a little bit of confidence. He was coming off that knockout loss, and maybe that's what it was, and maybe those are gone, and he has some confidence back, but he didn't look like himself, and he was actually almost finished in that fight with a spinning back fist. Both of these guys are chinny, and that's what makes this takedown or breakdown pretty tough. If Durden had a better chin, or even better game planning, he would be a phenomenal underdog here. The problem is that Durden comes into these fights thinking that he's a Golden Gloves champion only to get dropped or put in trouble and dealing with chaos because he's, he's coming out like this instead of just shoot the takedowns, dude. That's what you're good at. It's okay. You're fun. You are exciting on the ground. Shoot the takedowns. And this is not a fight where he wants to be hanging around the feet too long. If he wrestled earlier and didn't get sucked into firefights, he would have a much better record. The gunslinging is fun to watch. And it shows that he's got a nice set of balls on him. 
but Van can send fire back his way. Shit, Durden was losing the striking exchanges to Matt freaking Schnell before he got the choke. So I am surprised, though, that he is the dog here. I think people assume that this fight's going to look like when Josh Van fought Zalgazuma Gulov. If you didn't watch that fight, Josh Van shows up on short notice, fights a pretty good wrestler, defends all the takedowns, touches him up, styles on him, wins that fight, looks spectacular. I think people think that's what this is going to be, that Cody Dern's going to look desperate, shooting takedowns, not getting him. I don't see it that way. Cody Dern's going to be the pick. I think he's going to win this fight. I am going to bet on him. Right now, he is a plus 135 underdog. If I see that dip to plus 130, meaning the line is closing, I'm going to hit it. If it's widening, I'm going to wait. I want to get the best value possible. I think Durden's going to win here. I will take experience over anything. They're both chinny. I just hope that Durden comes in here to win and not looking to entertain with some hood rat mouthpiece. Then we have Mosvar Evloev taking on former world champion Aljamain Sterling. Mosvar Evloev, undefeated in his career. Mostly decisions, though. Not exactly an exciting fighter. This might be a fight where you can take a break. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen in this fight. You, you probably want to take a break. Take a nice piss. Flip the steaks on the grill. You do not need to be in front of your TV for this fight. You just don't. Because Mozvar Evlev is a decision machine. Fantastic wrestler. He uses his striking really well. He's got good striking, and he sets up his takedowns with that. He keeps his punches long. He manages range. To, he'll lower his level. He'll shoot the legs. He'll even shuck the head and go right after it. He keeps that extended hand out. The adjustments and setups differentiate him from other wrestlers in the division. He has 38 takedowns in eight UFC fights. He's coming off the one-sided win over Arnold Allen where there was some controversy about some knees. He's taking on former world champion Aljamain Sterling. He's a backpack grappler. He'll push for takedowns. He'll stick to you like an extra layer of skin. Over time, he has developed some striking. It's his own pretty wide stance style where he uses kicks. He manages range. He lands almost five significant strikes per minute and he only absorbs about two. And that's because he does a good job with his footwork and his range control. He is coming off that dominant grappling win over Calvin Cater in his featherweight debut. And I actually like Aljamain Sterling. I even supported him. I bought his rum, the Funk Harbor rum. I'll probably drink some of it at UFC 310 for the vlog. But even though I'm a fan, it doesn't mean I'm delusional. Most people are delusional. They're fans of fighters. They just can't see the world for what it is. Aljamain gets smoked here. He's not going to be able to outgrapple Mosvar Evloev. Are you serious? A much bigger, much better wrestler? That is not going to happen. Unfortunately for Aljo, this is probably literally the worst matchup in this division for him. Aljo trains with Marab. Oh, but Ange, Aljo trains with Marab. Aljamain Sterling is not going to magically absorb Marab's wrestling skills through osmosis. He's not a plant leaning towards the sun. That's just not going to happen. He is who he is. And Mosley Evlev is Aljamain, but much better. Mosley Evlev wins this fight. I have him parlayed. And I'll give you the other half of the parlay when we get to that fight. Then we got Michael Chiesa's old ass taking on Max Griffin. This was another epiphany. Again, I build these graphics. Beautiful, like spectacular custom graphics. Look at these things. Just pause the screen, look at these graphics and say, damn, dude, not only... Do I have both fighters on here? I know what weight class this fight's going to be at. I see their records. I have all the stats. This is incredible. When we do our Tuesday shows, you also get the odds. I mean, next level graphics. And while I was doing the graphics here, I knew Michael Chiesa was old. But I didn't realize Max Griffin was the older fighter. And that is a little interesting tidbit. And the more you know, you're welcome. Michael Chiesa, pretty one-dimensional guy. He's been the same guy his entire UFC career. He is a grappler. Straightforward game plan. He's going to come forward, look for takedowns, and then just work from there. He does not have a versatile set of takedowns, but the few that he has, like some body locks, a double here and there, do work well for him. Once he's on top, he's got solid pressure. He can alternate between ground and pound and submissions. He's coming off that dominant win over an elderly Tony Ferguson. He's taking on Max Griffin. Max Griffin's a pretty powerful striker. He's got some incredible knockouts, a total of eight knockdowns in his UFC career. He famously almost knocked Ramiz Brahimai's ear clean off his head. And while he is primarily a striker, he's also a solid grappler. He averages about two takedowns per fight. He's coming off that razor-thin win over Jeremiah Wells back in February. And Mikey Mav 
is at the tail end of his career, working the desk job, clearly trying to move to the next thing. And it makes sense. And again, I was surprised to see that he was the younger fighter. Max Griffin, ripe old age of 39 years old, and he's starting to look it. He's definitely slowing down. He's lost a little bit of pop in those strikes. I expect this fight to probably be a pretty sloppy back and forth war, but I do think Kies is going to get it done. By no means is he some sort of super athlete, but I think he's going to come forward. I think he will slow this pace down because that's where he's going to need it and then get his wrestling going. This is sloppy. I do have a feeling it's going to be a decision, so I might take a stab at Michael Chiesa at plus three and a half. He is the underdog. We'll see when the props drop if he's still a dog. And if you don't know what plus three and a half is, you're basically betting the spread. There's three rounds. And if Michael Chiesa can win one round on all the judges' scorecards, that bet will hit. And there's more complicated math than that, but that's the easiest way to describe it. So I'm going to wait for those props. And if I can get a plus three and a half on Michael Chiesa, I think we'll be good because I do think he wins this fight, but I'll give up a little bit of the odds for some safe net. So even if he loses a close, loses a split, something like that, I'll still get paid. Then we have the rematch of the century. You may not know this, but this is a rematch. These two grappled last year. I'll give you the results of that in a second. We got Clay Guida taking on Chase Hooper. Clay Guida is an absolute legend. If you have been watching this as long as I have, you know who Clay Guida used to be. He's 42. That's not who he is anymore. But you know who he used to be. Some of the best fights you've ever seen in your entire life. He is a dying breed of fighter. Just nonstop, all gas, no brakes, absolute war type fighter. These young kids, they're too technical. They're not willing to go in there and go crazy. Clay Guida did. The last of a dying era of fighters. But even at 42 years old, with 62 fights, he can hang. He sets a relentless pace with both his hands and his wrestling. He does not have the best submission defense, but he does have a great chin. He's definitely starting to slow down. But even a slow 42-year-old Clay Guida can outwork a lot of people. He's coming off that fun loss to Joaquin Silva where they exchanged takedowns. It was very sloppy overall, but it was a fun fight to watch. He's taking on Chase Hooper. If Chase Hooper isn't the opposite of Clay Guida, I don't know what it is. Chase Hooper is not a wild man. He's not going to come in going nuts. He's going to be technical and calm. Clay Guida or Chase Hooper looks like the kind of guy you would let babysit your kid. Like, yeah, you got, come on. You can play with him. Look at you. Innocent little Chasey squeezing his chin, his cheeks. A grandmother's dream. Little baby Chase Hooper. But he's turned into a man right in front of our eyes. He's a slick grappler. The takedowns are improving. The striking is improving. Wasn't long ago that the takedowns didn't even exist and the striking was god-awful. But just a few years into his UFC career, he is definitely evolving. He's coming off that win over Vaishlav Borshev, where he dropped him. He dropped Vaishlav before snatching up a Darce. And yes, you heard that correctly. Little baby Chase Hooper with the squeezable cheeks dropped and outstruck the team alpha male striking coach before submitting him. I mentioned this is a rematch. Chase Hooper smoked Clay Guida. They grappled at the Fury Grappling Championships, whatever the hell it is. And it was an absolute one-sided beating. Clay shot a takedown. Chase spun behind him super quick and then went to work. He probably could have submitted him 10 different ways. Ultimately landed on a calf slicer. You know what kind of a pain in the ass it is to submit somebody with a calf slicer? And that just shows you the wild gap in these two gentlemen's grappling. Chase Hooper is going to win this fight. The odds indicate that as well. So it's not the greatest value in the world. And this is obviously a fist fight and not a grappling match, but it doesn't matter. Chase is going to dominate here. This is not the 2008 version of Clay Guida that had the relentless speed and the pressure. This is the 2024 version. He's older, he's slower, he's a little sloppier. Chase is the pick, and he is who I parlayed with Movsvar Evloyev. There is a third person I wanted to add to that parlay, but we don't have those odds yet. And I'll tell you who that is in a minute. Hey, how about these teasers? After the break... Insert ad. Go to Young LA. Hayabusa. Those are people I'd like you to support because they support us. Then we got Anthony Smith taking on Dominic Reyes. It's the return of Dominic Reyes. Dominic Reyes is back. He's back. He's not, and I'll tell you why. Anthony Smith, 
People love to hate on the guy, but he's pretty good. He's a striker with fantastic hands, solid kicks. We all know his jiu-jitsu is pretty good, right? He's got submissions over several ranked fighters in the division. Incredibly tough, arguably too tough for his own good. He's taken some insane beatings throughout his career, and now he's seeing ghosts yelling at people, telling them, why'd you break into my house? The guy's losing it. He's losing it. And that's what many, many, many years of fist fights will do to you. But he is still a good fighter. He's at a weird point in his career where he's well past his prime. He is starting to focus on that analyst career, but he can still be competitive. And he's still kind of a name, so the UFC uses him in these interesting spots. But this is a good matchup for him, if you will. He's fighting another guy that's been on Struggle Street. Not the youngest guy in the world either. And a guy they're looking to get a win. And I think they're figuring out here, all right, is Anthony Smith done? Or can we turn Dominic Reyes back into somebody? Because Dominic Gray is a former title challenger. A lot of people think he beat John Jones. Even the ultimate John Jones glazer himself, Dana White. After that fight, Dana White said, I think Dominus Reyes won that fight. Ultimately, John Jones got the nod, going down as the greatest of all time. But it shows you what skills Dominic Reyes possesses. But since he lost that title, he was knocked out in back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back fights. Style-wise, he is primarily a striker. He's got some pretty good power, clean technique, good timing. He has two takedowns in the UFC, a very low 28% takedown accuracy, but a solid 80% takedown defense. He did just break that insane four-fight losing skid with a quick knockout win over Dustin Jacoby. Dominic Reyes got his first win in five years, and he is back. He is almost a 4-1 to one favorite over a former title challenger because he beat... Dustin Jacoby. I think that's insane. I like Dustin, but I think that is insane. I know this is the most what have you done for me lately sport on the planet, but are we serious? A four to one favorite? Anthony Smith is old. He's slower. He's a little crazy, but he's still a gamer with some very real skills. The problem with breaking down this fight though is that Dominic Reyes' last fight was only two minutes. So he has only fought three and a half minutes in the last three years. And this might be a fun fight, but by no means is it the resurrection of Dominic Reyes. I'm going to pick Anthony Smith here because at the very least, I know that Anthony Smith is going to show up and he's going to fight and his chin is not going to immediately quit on him. But in no world should people be betting on this fight. And I cannot remind you enough. And I know tens of thousands of people will watch this and a whole bunch of you are going to miss the entire point because that's just how it works. But picks and bets are not the same thing. I don't care what some tracking spreadsheet says. Tracking picks and somehow converting those to money line bets for no reason whatsoever is not a way to look at this. Me saying, I think Anthony Smith wins here is an entirely different conversation than me saying Chase Hooper smokes Clay Guida. Those are not the same. Sure, on a spreadsheet with a voiceover, they look the same. They are not the same. You need to pay attention to the words and not just the picks. Confidence levels matter. Where you actually put your money matters. I made a whole bunch of money in the last couple of months. I'm up 11 of the last 13 fight cards. The safety parlay hit seven in a row. I'm seven of the last eight safety parlays. That's real money. Those are real bets that we wrote down and said you should tail. Just looking at a list of picks and betting on every single one equally, that is not how you track success. That makes no sense. It is illogical. And the only reason I'm going on this rant here is because I'm trying to save you from yourself. I am picking Anthony Smith because I don't trust Dominic Reyes' horrific chin. The guy has one win in five years. I just can't do it. But I'm saving you from yourself because yes, I'm picking that way. But don't, oh, Angelo picked him and then spend money on it. Don't do it. You don't need to bet on every fight, especially this shit. Please, let me save you. But also let me give you 50 bucks. If you go to wewantpicks.com slash bets and you sign up with any one of our affiliate partners using the link, we send you 50 bucks as a thank you. Those Sportsbooks affiliates are going to pay me after you sign up and make an account, make a deposit. So I'm going to slice off 50 bucks and I'm going to give it right back to you. All you need to do is fill out this little form. You put your account number in there so we can validate you actually use the link and then we get you paid. Wewantpicks.com slash bets. You can use that money if you want. Become a premium member if you aren't already. 
Here's a look at those last 13 cards. I set them up 11 of the last 13 cards. And this is what that looks like. Over 11 units of net profit, a 22% ROI. Nobody bats a thousand. Nobody. It's impossible. But what I can do is be up 11 of the last 13 cards. I can be Mr. Consistency with an occasional flub. And that's what this looks like, Mr. Consistency. Here's the last five pay-per-views. If you're a guy that just shows up or, or a gal who just shows up for the pay-per-views, I get it. Life is busy. I had to wake up at God knows what time to watch UFC Macau fights. That's not for everybody. Well, here's a look at how I do on the pay-per-views. Here's the last five. The last five months of pay-per-views. 7.49 units of net profit. A 37% ROI on the last five pay-per-views. This is not an accident. It's not a coincidence. One good card is a coincidence. 11 of 13 is not. Five beautiful pay-per-views in a row is not a coincidence. We want picks.com. Click become a member. It's $10. And you'll unlock everything you can need, including tools. Not everybody just wants to copy-paste best. Some people want to do their own research. And for you, we went out and built the greatest research tool in this space. The data analyzer is the be-all, end-all of research tools. It has every single fight for months out. You're going to get every single data point you could ever need for any fighter. And then you can interact with that data. You can stack filters. You can even click the plot points and see who the judges were, how each judge scored the card. And then you could watch the actual fights of these guys' history. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. It's freaking $10, you cheap, cheap sons of bitches. And we have 12 units sitting there waiting for you to unlock them for not only UFC 310, but also UFC Tampa, which is the card immediately following that. Let's talk about the main card opener, at least for now. This fight order is going to change and we're two weeks out, so fights are going to cancel and switch and switch and whatever else. But for now, we have Bryce Mitchell, the lock of the century, taking on homeless Kron Gacy. And I get if he's homeless. His last performance was one of the most pathetic things I've seen in my entire life. So it is not crazy that his family, who has spent generations building that last name, Building a name that you just hear it and you immediately know. You hear Gracie. I'm so-and-so Gracie. Holy shit. You are in lineage of some of the best grapplers that have ever lived. Your family essentially invented Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You're pioneers of this sport. They spent generations building that last name only for Crone Gracie to lay on his back like an upside-down turtle acting like a complete bitch on national TV. Crone Gracie sucks at fistfights. Sucks at it. I uh, buried the lead. My bad. Spoiler. Bryce Mitchell, I shit on him for the Arkansas wrestling. That's just me having good fun. I wrestled my whole life from the Northeast. Pretty strong wrestling region. Arkansas, not really known for its wrestling. But Bryce Mitchell has done as much as you could possibly do with an Arkansas wrestling background. He sticks to that game plan. He averages about three takedowns per fight, a little more than that. And that's because he does have phenomenal control. And he is a very good grappler. Is he as good of a grappler as Crone Gracie? No, probably not. Not in the raw grappling. But you add in the wrestling, you add in the fact that he's an absolute man, lives on a ranch, thinks the earth is flat, aliens are watching us. That type of guy beats the piss out of Crone Gracie. And that's just how this fight's going to go. He did just get knocked out with the loudest one-punch knockout I have ever heard in my entire life as a UFC fan. That was bad. But it'll be fine because what's Crone Gracie going to do? He's going to knock you out? It's ridiculous. Crone Gracie's a very good grappler, not a good fist fighter. Just isn't. Cub Swanson smoked him. Then he took five years off and said, I got to work on my hands. I'm going to get better, guys. I'm going to spend five years to get better. Came back. Just awful, awful, looking homeless. Bryce Mitchell wins this fight, easiest thing in the world. We don't have odds for this yet. And if he's anything other than minus 400,000, the mortgage is getting on him. Bryce Mitchell smokes here. It's a joke. Then we got Nate Landwehr taking on Du Ho Choi, the Korean superboy. Nate the train, wild man. He's going to run forward. He's going to throw wild. He's going to look for a finish at all costs. He is a talented guy. He's got power. He's got skills. But he does willingly put himself into harm's way for no reason whatsoever. He has never been in a boring fight. I don't anticipate this one being boring either. He's typically looking to pressure. 
get it to the ground and work from there. He's coming off that finish win over Jamal Emmers, where in typical Nate the Train fashion, he took a ton of damage, but then he moved forward anyway and had relentless pressure. He's taking on Du Ho Choi, also known as the Korean Superboy. He's an exciting fighter. He has five fight of the night bonuses and only seven UFC fights. Style-wise, powerful striker, okay takedown defense. Does a good job throwing straight punches and staying active without getting too wild. He is very talented, but what has been a little bit of a spotty record. I blame that record, though, on how quickly he was given ranked fighters. He came in, he looked good, he was excited, the UFC looked to build him, boom, boom, boom. Here's very good fighters, probably a little too early in your career. He is coming off that win over Bill Algeo, though, which was his first in eight years. But the Korean Superboy is not a boy at all. He is 33 years old. He's only got a few good years left in his career, and he has a lot of hype to live up to. This could definitely be a fight that doubles his stock, right? He just beat Bill Algeo. Before that, very good fight with Kyle Nelson that he would have won if he didn't have a point taken away. I'm expecting this to be a fun fight. If he can finish a very durable Nate Landwehr, then we're going to be talking about, oh, the recent return. Look at the activity. He's back, baby. The problem, though, is that Choi's takedown defense is not the best. Nate has incredible pressure, especially with the takedowns. Nate can also be categorized as chinny because he looks like he's going to get knocked out in every fight, but he somehow doesn't. So Nate's going to be the pick. Before you get too crazy, though, remember he is 36 years old and there's only so many almost knocked outs that you can have before you actually get knocked out. Going to pick Nate. I think the pressure, the wrestling is going to be the difference. Eventually, Nate's going to be old and he's going to be flat on that canvas. I just don't think it's in this fight. Then we have Cyril Gan taking on Alexander Volkov. This is a rematch from 2021. Gan danced around, won a pretty clear striking decision. This was also supposed to happen a few cards ago and it got moved. And before I break this down, hey, if you're watching this, right? You're watching... Big, beautiful Ange on a late Saturday morning breakdown UFC 310. And then you're going to watch our live stream the Tuesday night before this event, Jacob and I. Let's count how many times. We're going to turn into a drinking game. Don't tell him. Don't be some weird loser in the Discord. It's like, Angela sent this. Let's take a shot. I'll, I'll, this is what we're going to do, okay? And this could end up being a problem. Actually, it's later in the card, so we'll be okay. This is what we're going to do. For UFC 310, the live Tuesday night breakdown before the event, I am going to sit here with the Funk Harbor rum, Aljamain Sterling's rum. And every time Jacob says cereal instead of cereal, we'll take a shot. But if you tip him off and he's just going to say it over and over, we're we're not doing it. All right? Don't be some snitch weirdo. Be a person. I thought we were bros. Fucking snitch. We got cereal gone. Technical striker, high-volume guy, well-rounded arsenal with the striking. He's got one of those best in-and-out striking games you're going to see. One of the best ever, honestly, at least at this weight class. His striking differential is impressive. Landing five, only getting hit with two. And that speaks to how incredible his footwork and movement really is. He also uses that footwork to set up the occasional takedown. He took down Dante Mays a few times, Rosenstruck a few times, Francis Ngannou. But if we have learned anything from that Ngannou fight and his last fight with John Jones, it's that Cyril can be out-wrestled. He doesn't really defend takedowns that well. He's coming off that KO win over Sergey Spivak where he landed, these are correct stats, he landed 109 significant strikes to Sergey's, I'll let you guess, 11. I don't think I've ever seen somebody get their strikes 10 times, but we did. And he's taking on Alexander Volkov. Top 10 heavyweight. He's been a top 10 heavyweight for seven years. He's been in the UFC for a very long time, and he has been at the upper echelon of this division the entire time. He's a very good striker, high IQ guy. He's fast. He's got good volume. He picks his shots well. He'll adapt in fights. He's not a big power guy. He's tremendous. He's six foot seven, but he doesn't have a ton of power. It's a lot of jabbing, a lot of movement on his side as well, and his timing suits him well enough to get the occasional finish. He's a very durable guy. He has fought the literal best the UFC has to offer since his debut in 2016. And he's coming off that decision win over Sergei Pavlovic. But it was a lot of jabbing. Volkov was able to get in the win column. And he did it with a striking match against one of the scariest strikers in the division. So that's a testament to Volkov's skill, his game planning, his high IQ. But his game plan in that fight was be long against a flat-footed power striker. That game plan, the one he used to beat 
Sergei Pavlovich in his last fight isn't going to work here. Gan already beat him, and he did it by being faster with the feet, faster with the hands, and a ton of movement. The interesting part, though, about their first matchup is that Volkov attempted zero takedowns. Gan actually attempted four takedowns. Volkov has not covered the ground in the striking gap, so he's just going to get pieced up here. The problem is you need Volkov to wrestle if you think he's going to win, and he hasn't taken someone down since 2020, and I don't see a dramatic shift here. I'm happy Volkov got a win in his last fight, but fighting a flat-footed or flat-footed overhand power guy is not fighting Cyril Gaon. Cyril Gaon's literally dancing around in his tippy toes. He's hard to get to. We already watched Volkov lose this fight. So what has Volkov improved on? I see a lot of people thinking Volkov wins. What has Volkov improved on since their last fight that makes you think he covered enough ground to win here? It wasn't close. It was not a close fight. Like, Cyril dominated that fight. Did he almost finish him? No. Neither one of these guys are finishers. But Cyril dominated that fight. I just don't see how this one's going to be any different. Then we have a very fun, very interesting main event, co-main event. It's a short notice matchup. It's not necessarily a short notice fight, but the matchup is short notice because Shavkat was already on this card. He was supposed to be fighting Bilal Muhammad for the belt. And while Ian Gary wasn't on this card, he was on UFC Tampa, which is just seven days after. So I don't anticipate any issues or weird adjustments. I don't see any problems with a shortened fight camp by one week for Ian Gary. I think they're both going to be well prepared and we'll get the best versions of both of them. I did think that this was a championship fight. I thought they were going to do an interim title. They're not. This is just this is five rounds, but it's not for a title. It's just a fun five-round co-main event. And it's a polarizing fight. Shavkat Rachmanov. Seems like a very special kind of fighter. He's one of those guys, when you watch him fight, you know he's going to do big things in this sport. He is 18-0 and 0 with a 100% finish rate. He's knocking people out. He's taking people down. He's submitting people. He's jumping guillotines and getting those. He can win any fight anywhere. He's a hard guy to hit. He's got a ton of power, good pressure, solid defensive wrestling, decent judo. He's very active when he gets to the ground. And he's coming off that submission win over Wonder Boy, where he did, though... Only go one for five in takedown attempts. He's taking on Ian Machado Gary. Solid striker with crazy hand speed and fantastic footwork. He is hittable. He lands an impressive almost six significant strikes per minute. He's got solid enough takedown defense to keep most fights on their feet. And while he does have power, it's not necessarily big one-punch power, right? It's timing. It's speed. And that's what he catches people with. He may say he has had an easy road to the UFC, or at least a lot of people will say he's had an easy road in the UFC. But he did battle through adversity, right? Song Kanan almost had him out. MVP was giving him a hard time, so he changed the game plan on the fly, started wrestling and grinding. And I am going back and forth on this fight. I know a lot of you are very positive Shavkat Rachmanov wins this fight. I'm going back and forth. The people all just think Shavkat is this division savior. But the reality is, his takedowns kind of suck, guys. His takedowns honestly suck. He barely got Wonder Boy to the ground. He couldn't get Jeff Neal to the ground. He has a 29% takedown accuracy overall. I do think he needs to get this to the ground to win because Ian's a very good striker, and if he defends some takedowns early, he can make Shavkat pay for bad entries. Ian, like, Ian's not perfect either, right? We just watched him struggle a little bit. You could argue he lost that MVP fight. He only landed nine significant strikes in 15 minutes. That's embarrassing. He needed a pair of takedowns to lock up rounds. So Shavkat is obviously the more dangerous of the two. He's got 18 stoppage wins. That's insane. But if he doesn't stop Ian, can Shavkat Rachmanov fight for 25 minutes? Does it even matter if he can fight for 25 minutes? This is a much harder fight to pick than pop culture is going to have you think. Minus 350 odds on Shavkat Rachmanov seems very wide. There's also something to be said about Ian taking this fight. He is meticulous with his career. He's not just some Cowboy Cerrone style, I'll fight anybody, anywhere, anytime. That is not who Ian Gary is. He's meticulous with his career. He's taking it very, very seriously. He knows how important it is to be undefeated and to build your way up. He's very realistic. So for him to accept this fight and not just turn it down and move on, he had a fight booked. He was fighting Joaquin Buckley. And Joaquin Buckley is a much easier opponent than Rachmanov. Much easier. So for him to step in here, not for a title, and take this fight, 
says something about Ian's confidence. They are obviously very confident they're going to win this fight. It'd be one thing if he's coming off the sidelines, it's for a title, a ton of money, but that's not what we're getting. There is no title here. I'm sure they offered him good money, right? It's an increase in opponent. It's a pay-per-view co-main. But it is very interesting that he took this fight without hesitation. I am still going to pick Shavkat because he is the more dangerous of the two, and I think he can get this fight to the ground. But this fight scares me, and these minus 350 odds honestly seem crazy to me. And maybe a sneaky good bet will be the round over. Maybe we get some crazy one and a half round on a five round fight. And maybe we do the over. But this fight's very polarizing. I'm curious who else thinks this is a close fight. Don't tell me you're the Shavkat crew because 99% of people are like, Shavkat, Shavkat, Shavkat. I want to hear from the other people, the people like me, the reasonable ones that are like, eh, Shavkat's takedowns are kind of ass. And we have no idea what his cardio is, like no clue for 25 minutes. I'm curious if those people exist or if I'm the only one. Jacob is insanely confident in this and was basically clowning me for having any hesitation whatsoever. So we'll see. Maybe y'all are right. Then we have the main event. A very rare instance. We have Alexandre Pantoja looking to defend his belt for the third time, but this time it is against a UFC newcomer. In the modern era of UFC, we do not often get a main event with a UFC debut, let alone a title fight main event with a UFC debut. This is a few and far between type situation, especially in this modern era of UFC where anybody talented is locked into a contract and nobody is really famous enough outside of the UFC for the UFC to spend a bunch of money on. But they got Kai Asakura coming in hot. Kai Asakura, the two-time world champion, bringing an entire nation with him. And I think the UFC might want him to win here for that entire nation, to have a champion from that part of the world. Die-hard fight fans. But we'll start with Pantoja. We'll give him the respect. He is the champion of the world. He loves to walk forward. And he goes to absolute work. He's got okay power. He delivers some damage, mostly a fantastic grappler, though. Good ground control, good ground and pound. His striking is pretty formulaic. He doesn't take a lot of risks, but he's effective. And when he combines that striking with some power and some pressure, he has a ton of success. He's incredibly durable. One of the only people who have really seen give him trouble are big-time wrestlers. People that can take him down and control him are the people that have success. Other than that, Alexandre Pantoja is taking people down, getting it done. He's coming off that second title defense with a win over Steve Ursaig. A lot of people thought that was close. I didn't. He had nine takedowns. Seemed pretty clear to me that he was controlling. He's taking on Kai Asakura. He is a 135-pounder making his way down to 125 pounds in a title fight. Style-wise, he's fast. He's aggressive. He's a good striker. And he thrives in those pride-style rules. If you don't know what that is, Pride was a former promotion that they bought up and they that's where Shogun came from, Vanderlei Silva, a whole bunch of people. But you can stomp, you can soccer kick, you can knee to the head of a gra very grounded opponent. And Kai Asakura thrives under that rule set. He absolutely goes nuts. He's a very dangerous, very fun striker. He's lightning fast, very creative, a ton of killer instinct. He never lets off the gas. He has no issue putting himself into harm's way to find a finish. He's very mobile, very hard to corner. The takedown defense is the biggest question here because he hasn't fought a ton of wrestlers, let alone grapplers. And there is no better way to find out how your weight cut's going to go than in a title fight against a pressure wrestler. I don't know what going down from 135 to 125 is going to look like. Kai Asakura is a very exciting guy. It's a great signing by the UFC. Japanese superstar. He'd be a far more exciting champion than Pantoja. Pantoja is not very exciting. But unfortunately, I don't see him winning here. He has not fought a ton of grapplers. He doesn't fight as well moving back as he does moving forward. And he's going to be fighting in the UFC for the very first time. Probably going to slow down because of that weight cut. And if he's backing up because Pantoja's coming forward shooting those takedowns, I just don't see Kai Asakura winning. Alexandre Pantoja being minus 235 seems like a phenomenal deal. Guys, that's the breakdown. Go to wewantpicks.com, become a freaking premium member. We have a ton of bets on the board right now for not only UFC 310, but UFC Tampa. We also have tools. One of those tools is the data analyzer. All of the future fights that you could ever want or need 
If you are a prepared person, maybe you're a prepper. You got a couple of shovels, a pickaxe for no reason. Well, why don't you prep for the future events? Use the data analyzer. You got future data. You can stack filters. You can hover the plot points to see all the information. Then if you click a plot point, you can literally watch that fight. Do all the tape study you could have ever wanted or needed. You're going to get other tools like the line movement tracker. This is going to give you the opening odds, the current odds, the win probability, and the line movement for every fighter on every card. You're going to get the Prop Hunter, a curated set of data specifically designed to help you find prop bets. You're going to get the DraftKings Optimizer. This is preloaded with quite literally the best and most consistent ownership projections on planet Earth. And you're also going to get a kid from New Zealand who really is just kind of disheveled looking, but he's, kind of, he's like a savant picking fights. The guy picked the perfect card just two weeks ago and an artificial intelligence picking fights based solely off of historical data. All of this and a whole bunch of other things, only freaking $10. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. You're not just going to get UFC 310. You're also going to get UFC Tampa. And we have 12 units ready to go on the board between Jacob and I right now, this minute. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. And don't forget, you want that $50 promo? We want picks.com slash bets. Got to use the link. Got to make an account, got to make a deposit, but then we'll send you 50 bucks as a thank you. Guys, enjoy your Thanksgiving. If you're an American, if you're not, sorry, it's a week off. There's no fights. It is where it is. Go watch my damn vlogs. Those are exciting. Those are entertaining. That'll get you through the week. I appreciate it. I'm thankful for you. Appreciate every last one of you. All sincerity. Good luck with your families and good luck with your bets.